Hey guys, and welcome to Gwent, the Witcher card game. My name is Jagoras, and a lot of you guys have been asking me, Hey Jag, what legendary cards should I craft? Well, I've decided to make a what legendaries you should craft video, basically. I'm going to give you my top three neutrals, as well as my top legendaries for each specific faction, depending on what you like to play. Okay, so I want to start by just saying that I would say that Decoy is a fantastic legendary to craft, but you get it for free at level 20. When you hit account level 20, you get Decoy for free. Do not craft Decoy. Do not pick Decoy if you're offered it as a legendary. Even though it's really good, if you can hold out until level 20, you're going to get this card for free, guys, so it's not worth crafting. Decoy returns a non-gold, non-relentless unit on your side to your... A hand, add three to its base strength, and then immediately play it again. So it basically lets you replay a bronze or silver non-relentless card, uh, which has so many different applications in different kind of decks. If you watch my deck video, you'll see all the different ways that decoy can be used. It's a fantastic legendary. Don't craft it. Okay, guys, so in third place, we have Roach. She is a great little silver legendary that slots into more or less any deck. Now, I will say, you know, don't craft Roach if you don't have, you know, four golden cards per deck. But in terms of golden cards, there's lots of great, you know, uh, epic golden cards you can craft. Uh, and then you can have Roach in your deck. What she does is you play on a random row from your deck or graveyard whenever a gold card appears on your side. So whenever you play a gold card, Roach gets played from your deck. And as soon as she's out of your deck, you know, she's then in the graveyard. But if you play another gold card, she gets pulled out of the graveyard. So she gives you some deck thinning. All of your gold cards then have, you know, three extra points attached, and she has some interesting synergies with some other gold cards. For example, uh, Vilgefort, so you can target her to burn her up, and Milva from the uh, Scoyatel. Basically, if you play Milva as your very first card, Milva then draws Roach, and then you draw Roach back into your hand, and your opponent draws nothing. So you get, basically, a free card. It gives you card advantage, effectively. Um, and yeah, she's just like, once you have her as a legendary, it's kind of one of these legendaries where you're like, well, you know, why did I never have this legendary before? Because she just slots into so many decks uh, in a silver slot, and it's just a nice card to have. So next up in second place, we have Triss Merigold. Triss is an eight strength golden card, which removes four strength from a non-gold unit. And this is any gold unit on your side or on your opponent's side. So this is effectively 12 strength. Um, which can then slot into any deck. So kind of similar strength level to uh, Geralt. But what she does is, you know, she she has targeted damage. So you can use this to remove, say, a problematic card. Alternatively, if someone throws a problematic card onto your side, such as a cow carcass, you can use this to remove that. Um, again, it's, it's a card that fits into any deck. And I'm a big, you know, I'm a big fan of cards that fit into any decks. I think Triss, again, is a great legendary to have. Because, you know, if you're in a situation where, you know, you want to play uh, Nilfgaard, you want to play Skelliger, you want to play... Whatever faction, Triss, this card will work as one of your gold cards in the similar way to uh, to Geralt. So then, you know, you only need two gold cards for those decks. So at that stage, you know, you've, you've basically got kind of a base set that will fit into any deck. And that's why I think Triss is a really good card to craft. So if you watch my videos, this will come as no surprise. Geralt Igni, some people call it Gigni, is in my game so, so good. This is like a card where you regularly get, you know... 18 plus points of value out of Igni. Igni destroys the strongest non-gold unit, bracket S, on the opposite row if that row totals 20 or more strength. So as soon as a row has 20 or more strength, you can pop down Igni and it will destroy the strongest unit on that row. If there is more than one unit with the same amount of strength, it will destroy all of the units with that value of strength. So if they have three sevens in a row, that's 21 points in the row, you pop down Igni, you kill all three of those sevens, plus you get four points for Igni. So that's 25, 25 point string string swing you know and there's there's very rarely a game where you know you don't play igni the only thing i would say is you know don't hold on to it you know don't hold on to it till the last round when no one's playing any cards because no one has any cards but igni is just it's a very strong card it's got a lot of value in it um and it can slot into any deck uh and you know it's actually worth slotting into most decks to be honest like i run this card in so many decks if you watch my deck guide if you're going to craft one legendary out of all of the legendaries, this is the one legendary that you craft. I recommend this to be the first legendary that anyone crafts if they don't find it in a pack. I was lucky enough and actually found it super early in a pack, but if you're going to craft a legendary out of all of the ones in this video, craft this one. So some people will argue that Avalanche is the must-craft monster legendary, but I just don't agree with that. I think Avalanche is a nice card. It's nice to have the option of card advantage, but, you know, it's a disloyal card, and, and having a golden card that also gives your opponent eight points, like having a golden card... Um, instead of a silver four card advantage, I just don't personally like. 
So for me, I think Caretaker, if you're running monsters, this is a fantastic card. And it fits into every monster deck. You're running Weather, this card works. You're running Consume, this card works. And there's all sorts of interesting things that can happen with Caretaker. Because Caretaker resurrects a non-gold, non-permadeath unit from the opposing graveyard. So you basically take a card from your opponent and play it. And that can be any non-gold card. So non-permadeath, non-gold. So Silver's fine. Bronze is fine. But, you know, this card, you often pull something interesting. You can use it to stop your opponent from, you know, resurrecting something that you wouldn't want them to resurrect. Maybe if they're doing a Skellige resurrection strategy, for example, this card can be really nice to take things off your opponent. You could steal their Roach, you know, just to stop them from resurrecting it every single time. There's lots of different kind of options that you get with Caretaker as to what you can take. And it also allows you often to play another faction's card uh, for your benefit. So I think Caretaker is just Again, it's, it's a card that fits into a lot of decks. And I think if you're crafting legendaries, the first ones you want to craft are the ones that are most the most versatile. And Caretaker is the one for monsters. So when it comes to Nilfgaard, there wasn't really much of a contest. If you're going to craft a Nilfgaard legendary, Vilgefortz is the one to craft. If you've crafted Roach, it has a really nice synergy. So destroy a non-gold unit. If it was on the opposite side, your opponent draws a card and reveals it. If it was on your side, draw and play a card. If your opponent has passed, you may only cut target a unit on your side. So Vilgefortz, you play it down, you get eight points, and then you destroy a non-gold unit either on your side or their side. Now, if they have a huge uh, strength non-gold unit, you can use it to kill it. They will draw a card, so, you know, they may get card advantage from it, but that could be enough to win you the game if they have one unit that is incredibly stacked, or maybe it's a unit that's resilient is going to be kept on the board. You've got that option. Alternatively, you target a unit on your side, and often, you know... Uh, you're going to be playing a lot of kind of small strength units. Uh, that's kind of what happens with Nilfgaard. For example, the Vicavara Medic is a two strength unit that you could always target. Um, you target that, you burn it up. So you burn up two strength, but then you get to draw and play. Uh, you get to draw and play a card, right? So that is is pretty good. Like it could be a gold card. It could be a silver card. It could be a bronze card. So you basically get to play an extra card with Vilgefortz. Now, if you have Roach, what happens when you play Vilgefortz is Roach then gets targeted. You then burn up. Uh, Roach, so you, you kind of throw her in the graveyard, which is fine, because, you know, if you play another gold card, she'll get resurrected, and then you get to play a second card. Um, and that's why Vilgefortz is really nice, and again, it's going to fit into every Nilfgaard deck. Okay, so for Northern Realms, I'm going to say Bloody Baron, which is interesting because this isn't actually a card I've crafted yet. This is a card I really want to craft, but because I've been making deck videos for you guys, I've basically been looking at getting a range of different cards, so I haven't been able to necessarily craft the cards that I would usually craft just because I'm crafting a lot of different things for different decks so that I can showcase the decks for you guys. Um, but Bloody Baron is a really, really good Northern Realms card. Again, it fits into every deck. What a surprise. So you play Bloody Baron, he has six strength, but because it's Northern Realms, he actually has eight strength because of their passive, you know, gold cards have plus two, at which point you either spawn a Botchling or a Lubberkin. Botchling, gain resilience, a resilient unit stays on the battlefield for the next round. So you could play the Botchling and you get five to keep uh, for the round, but more commonly people will play the Lubberkin. Every turn, add three strength to a random other non-gold unit on your side of the battlefield. Banish when moved to the graveyard. So you play out the Lubberkin, then every turn, the Lubberkin gives a random other non-gold unit on your side of the battlefield three strength. Uh, the Lubberkin is a massive target for locks for removal. But if your opponent cannot remove the Lubberkin, then the Lubberkin is going to give you so many points of value. And it's kind of a card where if your opponent can't deal with it, you know, that's the tough, tough titties to them, you know. If they can't deal with it, they're, they're most likely going to lose that round. Um, and the Bloody Baron himself, you know, he's got, what, eight points in Northern Realm anyway. So it's it's not, like, it's not even a weak card. You get you get the eight points, plus you get the Lubberkin, uh, which is either going to, you know, bait out or remove some of your opponent's removal, which means that they can't use that removal on other Northern Realm cards. Alternatively, it's going to give you a butt-ton of points. And, you know, who doesn't like a butt-ton of points? Exactly. So next up, we have Skelliger. And... In Skelliger, I think, again, the most versatile legendary, the one that I would craft first, is Coral. Coral, you spawn the appropriate weather effect on the opposite row only. Now, it's worth noting here that she can only be played in the ranged or siege row. So you can only spawn fog or rain. You can only play, you can't play her in the front row, you can't play frost. This is not clear at all from this description. Um, a lot of people don't realize that when they, when they try and use her, that you can't play her in the front row, but you can't. But again, so you're getting six strength and you're getting weather on the opposite row only. So that can be a massive swing because you don't have to worry about the fact that, you know, you've got a bunch of weather non-immune. So weather, uh, what's the word? 
vulnerable, where the vulnerable units on your siege or range row, because ultimately you, you're not going to hit, you're, you're not going to get weathered. It's weather only on your opponent, which is an incredibly strong effect. But do bear in mind, you can't play this on the cross row. Saying that, you know, I've seen Coral be the swing value, be the, the, the kind of game winner in so many games against Skelliger and playing Skelliger myself. Uh, as a kind of last card, boom, there's weather. You just lost all your points. She is fantastic. And uh, if you're going to craft one Skelliger card, this is the one that I would recommend. So Scoia'tael, you may have noticed, has a lot of good golden legendary cards. Uh, I have all of them. They're they're all very good. And actually, this is one of the factions where often you'll play your faction-specific legendaries over, say, neutral legendaries, just because of how good they are. Um, but for me, there's one that I would say is the must-craft one. If you're going to craft out, out of these, there's one that I would just say you definitely have to craft. But I want to give an honorable mention to Iglesias. A Glace resurrects a non-gold special card from your graveyard. So you get five strength on the board, and then you get to replay a special card that you've previously played, um, such as Scorch. So you can use a Glace to basically double Scorch your opponent. You can use her to play a Rally if you want to get a card out of your deck. You could use her to play an Elzer's Thunder. You could use her to play a Lacerate. There's a lot of cards that you can basically use her to replay. Um, and that is a very useful ability in itself, and it, it can be kind of game-changing in a lot of games. So... You know, I want to give her an honorable mention as a, a really decent legendary card. Saying that, uh, the one card that I would say you should definitely craft is Saskia. Saskia is a 7 strength golden card. Remove 1 strength from all opposing non-gold units. Add 1 strength to all non-gold units on your side of the battlefield except self. So... Saskia is seven, but you often get, you know, 15 plus points out of her. She's minusing one from everything on the opposing side. She's adding one to everything on your side. Um, so there's a big point swing there. And again, you can see just how easily this card fits into any deck. And cards that fit into any deck, I think, are the ones that you should be crafting. You know, if you want to make a very specific deck, then by all means, craft the legendaries for that deck, you know. So, for example, if you wanted to play monsters and you wanted to play consume, then definitely K-Ran is, a, you know, a good choice to craft. Uh, similarly, you know, if you were going to play, uh, let's think of a good example, Scoia'tael and you wanted to play, like, I don't know, Neophytes, then uh, Isengrim is a good choice for playing Commander Neo fights. But th these are very specific situations, you know. You want to play Skellige and maybe you wanted to play, like, some kind of Resurrect deck, then, you know, Ceres isn't a bad choice. Or if you wanted to play, like, maybe Morkvark, not a bad choice either. But they're all kind of designed for very specific decks. Whereas the Legendaries that I've recommended to you guys, you can play in any kind of deck that you want. Um, and they're really versatile, which means I think they're really good to have. Because if you get bored of playing your current deck, if you switch to a new kind of deck, these Legendaries will fit into that deck. You don't have to then start again from scratch, which is why I would say these are the better legendaries to craft. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it in terms of the recommendations for legendaries from me. Let me know which legendaries you think you should craft if you disagree with me at all in the comments below. Um, and if you like this video, do hit that thumbs up button, guys. Beyond this, you can catch me live streaming Gwent uh, at twitch.tv forward slash Jagoras. You can follow me on Twitter at Jagoras and there'll be a link to my Discord in the description below. Um, that's kind of more or less it. If you've enjoyed the content, then you can always subscribe. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Hopefully I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye.